السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عما بعد My dear respected علماء الكرام My dear brothers and sisters I consider it a great privilege and honor to be here amongst you at the International Islamic University in Malaysia and I am grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me the opportunity to come here and to talk to you not once but now I think this is the fourth time or something like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put khair in this for you and me and make whatever I have to say beneficial for you and me and save us all from any evil that is contained in the thoughts and words of man. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, the topic of today as Brother Ali mentioned is to try to understand the purpose of our existence. Why do we exist? Why, have, why are we there in the world? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us to do what? And I believe that it is important for me to remind myself and to remind you about this purpose. Because subhanAllah, a day will come about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلولا إذا بلغت الحلقوم وأنتم حينئذ تنظرون ونحن أقرب إليه منكم ولكن لا تبصرون فلولا إن كنتم غير مدينين ترجعونها إن كنتم صادقين. الله سبحانه وتعالى said a day will come when the breath will be stuck in the throat. And سبحان الله I don't know how many of you have actually witnessed, actually seen a person dying. I don't know how many of you have actually seen that, actual last moments of somebody's life. I have seen that and I can tell you Wallahi, this Quran is haq. This Quran is haq. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that when the breath is stuck in the throat and you are standing there and looking on, and you are standing there and watching a loved person, somebody you respect, somebody you love, and somebody for whom there is nothing in the world that you will not do. And what do you feel and what do you experience when you stand there? Complete helplessness. Complete helplessness. There is nothing that you can do. There is nothing that you can do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah says, return the breath in Kuntum Sadiqeen. If you are truthful, if you think you are so powerful, because subhanAllah, may Allah guide us. This is true of those who do not believe in Allah, and if that was restricted to that, then there would be some justification for it. But subhanAllah, today even some of the Muslims, they live lives 
where by their actions they are actually challenging the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ajib. And that and yet they say they are educated and yet they say that they are very wise. If you are educated and you are wise, how do you challenge the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When your education and your wisdom must tell you that you cannot even return one breath which is stuck in the throat. That is the extent of your power. That's the extent of my power. That is the extent of our power. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran, clearly and openly challenging statement. Return the breath. In Kuntum Sadiqi, you think you are so powerful, you think you are truthful, all these great claims you make about your technology and power and this and that and the other, fine, no problem. One human being, one single human being, return that one breath. Leave the rest of the world aside. We'll talk about all that power later on, inshallah. Once you return this one breath, then we can have a place to talk, something we can talk about. But if you cannot even return that one breath, then what are we talking about? And that is the reason why it is very important for us to understand our purpose. Because in the same Surah Al-Waqiyah, and these are the last ayat of Surah Al-Waqiyah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described three kinds of people. Three kinds of people. And he described their destinations. Three kinds of people and he described their destination, where they will go. Hamim <laughs> Three kinds of people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include all of us among the muqarrabin inshallah. Three kinds of people, three different destinations. What does it, what does that destination depend on? The destination we end up in depends on whether or not we fulfill the purpose for which we were created. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for a purpose and he said about this purpose, there is an individual purpose, the purpose for which the individual, the human has been created. And there is a collective purpose for which this ummah has been created. And we as Muslims need to fulfill both these purposes. The purpose for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the individual is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the insan for anything other than my, ibu, my ibadah, my worship. And inshallah we'll see how it is actually possible to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every single thing we do. I'm sure all of you are aware of these things obviously because you are from a premier learning institute, Islamic learning institution in the world but it's a good thing. Allah said, فَذَكِّرِنَّ الذِّكْرَةً فَعُلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ so it's a good thing to remind ourselves again and again, even though we know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, the individual purpose for which He created us. He said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ I've not created the jinn and the insan for anything other than my worship. 
and the collective purpose for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his whole ummah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas and he described what is the purpose what is to be done ta'muruna bil ma'roofi wa tanhauna anil munkar and he described the result of that wa tu'minuna billah now if we take the individual purpose for which we have been created the question obviously is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us only for his worship then how can I fulfill that purpose and why is it necessary to fulfill the purpose let me give you a very simple example take this recording device here now if this thing stops working what will you do you take it to the repair shop you try to see if you can repair it and if the man says this is gone finished I mean it cannot be repaired what do you do do you convert it into a necklace locket and you say no after all this thing poor thing gave me good service for so many years I'm going to now hang it around my neck like a you know pendant or maybe I will keep it in my house and I will look at it once in a while and say my mashallah mashallah subhanallah so much good service you gave me mashallah you know may you be happy will you do that you throw it in the garbage you get a new one yes same rule applies to everything we use if there is something which has been created for a purpose and that thing stops fulfilling its purpose what do you do you throw it maybe if it is expensive enough you try to repair it you knock it around a little bit and you see if it can be repaired if it can be repaired alhamdulillah if it cannot be repaired junk what is the definition of junk what is the definition of trash something which does not fulfill its purpose anymore that's trash garbage call it what you want same same thing the thing which does not fulfill its purpose is garbage now let's look at the purpose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us that we have Allah says we have not created a mankind and, and jinn for anything other than our worship so how can we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this we have to understand the definition of the word worship itself what is ibadah al ibadah is anything which is done with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the expectation of reward any action which is done with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the expectation of reward this is the definition of ibadah naturally if the action is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it must satisfy two conditions one that it should be in accordance with the sharia and two that it should not be against the sunnah because if I do an action which is against the sharia for example I say well I, Allah is pleased if I feed the poor people but the country I live in I maybe I live in Australia or somewhere and the country I live in the common food of the poor people is pork so feeding the poor people is a good thing so I'm going to give them a brilliant dinner of great pork dishes let them eat a lot of pork and after that uh, they like to have a you know a couple of cans of beer after the after the meal so I'm going to give them cases of beer so let them have a nice big meal of pork and you know drink a few cans of beer and alhamdulillah I'm pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it true no no because it is haram for the Muslim to deal in, 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 in pork and to deal in beer whether you give it away or you sell it or you whatever it is I mean, so the action even though the niyah is good the niyah of the action is good alhamdulillah I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the action itself fi nafsihi is against the sharia of Islam therefore it is not acceptable so I cannot say this is ibadah it is not ibadah it is something <laughs> something wrong I must tell the brother no don't do this give them some food which is halal in it. even if they are not Muslim for the Muslim to feed somebody which is haram for the Muslim is not just so ibadah is something which is done with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which is done with the expectation of reward and therefore naturally that action must be in keeping with the Sharia of Islam and in keeping with the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now if we apply this condition to our life and we remember the purpose of our creation is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let me remind myself and remind you how every breath we take can become ibadah one is we live with this consciousness that I Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Alaq and the ayat, the shan and nuzul of the ayah refers to Abu Jahl in that case, but the, the lesson is for us where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, does he not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him? So if we live with this consciousness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me, what is the biggest benefit of that? The biggest benefit of it is that it will actually become impossible for you and me to commit a sin because how can I commit a sin knowingly, deliberately, when I am aware consciously that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me? Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi in his uh, book Ar-Riyadu Salihin Babu Niyya describes Niyya very beautifully. And those of you who have read it will remember the description. Where he said, Al Izharu Niya fi kulli am fi look fi kulli akwal wa fi kulli amal wa fi kulli ahwal al barzat wal khafi. He said the awareness of the niya, why am I doing something? Awareness of the niya. Fi kulli akwal in ev in all that I speak, in all that we speak, wa fi kulli amal in all that we do, wa fi kulli ahwal in all the situations that we find ourselves in in life. Whether the thing is visible and public or whether it is hidden and private. See the beauty of this niyat. Now, in Amal Amalu bin Niyat, we know the hadith of Rasulullah. So now, if a person before he, before he speaks anything or he does anything, if he is questioning himself, what is my niyat? Why am I saying this? And he knows that the, niyya, the, the amal depends on the niyat. And he is aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. Is that person, is it possible for him to do anything which is wrong? No. Because the moment he even contemplates, and this is where Imam Ghazali, ta'ala, beautiful thing he said. Imam Ghazali said that in his book, Alayhi Wa He said, do not even entertain the thought of a sin. Because the thought will lead to the qawl to the speech and the speech will lead to the action in another place he said the first time the thought comes is from shaitan but if you retain it then it is from you thought can come shaitan can whisper in your ear wasavis but now this waswasa comes we know it is haram but we say all right it's waswasa you know i am not punishable for the thought so let me think about it. Uh, sounds nice. I won't do it, but just thinking about it. Ah, oh, subhanAllah, what a thought. Ah. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi. No. Imam Ghazali said, kill the thought, perish the thought, remove it, throw it away, junk it, garbage it. Because that thought is dangerous. That thought will lead you to actually doing that thing. So he said, don't, don't fall into that trap. So now if you take the, the uh, definition of the niya, and you say that I am going to be live a life of awareness and subhanAllah that is the reason why in Islam intoxication is haram any intoxicant is haram whether it is khamar or whether it is drugs or anything else which makes you lose your consciousness is haram because ghafla is haram now, it's not haram in the sense you don't, you don't get beaten for it but you know it is the idea of uh, Islam is to live with the constant awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, if you are taking some food or something which uh, makes you lose your consciousness, naturally this is not permitted. So if you live with this awareness, now you are living your whole life. You wake up in the morning, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You wake up in the morning and you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gave you another day. That He gave us the opportunity to live another day, to restart my life. Every day is the beginning of the rest of our life. People celebrate birthdays. Eh? Every day is a birthday because you are born on that day, reborn on that day. Your soul was sent back to you. So every single day is a birthday. And what, what do you do on that birthday? You take, you make muhasiba. You make muhasiba. You think about what did, my, what did I do with my life? How was my yesterday, day before yesterday, today, how will I live today differently from how I lived yesterday and the day before? How is this today going to be more beneficial for me, inshallah, in this dunya wal akhirah? So we wake up with this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we make muhasiba, we plan the day. With what intention? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with expectation of reward. 
Then I go and engage myself in work and activity and what is my whole thought? How can I present Islam to the world? Al-Izharul al Islam How can I present Islam to the world? Some of you have read some of my writings on what I call applied Islam. That is the biggest issue that we have today. Many of us are like walking libraries. We have got books and books and books in our heads. But in practice, there is a problem sometimes. Applied Islam. And that was the application of Islam which drew people to Islam. We talk about the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the akhlaq of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is the application of Islam. The famous hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha where somebody asked her, please tell us something about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, don't you read the Quran? He said, yes, I read the Quran. He said, that was the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the walking Quran. There's a beautiful story from the seerah of the time of Hunayn. When Rasulullah was going after Fatah Makkah, when he was going to Taif, and when he was going to Taif, <coughs> and he he was the head of the army, and his army was going to Taif, and in that army there were a lot of new Muslims. There were a lot of new Muslims. So, naturally it was not like, you know, the earlier armies of the Sahaba who were people who had Tarbiya. So what happened was that uh, when they went, at one point they stopped and it was time for Salah. It was time for Salah and Bilal Radhiallahu called the Adhan. No, don't worry about all that. Just sit, 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 listen. Just sit. This heat is Annaru Jahannam Ashaddu Harra. This har is fine, no problem. No worry. This is the har in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no problem. <coughs> So I was telling this story from the seerah of Rasulullah and the akhlaq of Muhammad Rasulullah and the effect of that. <coughs> they were going and they stopped in one place and Bilal radiallahu started calling the adhan. Now there was a group of young, young men of the Quraysh and these were the, they were from the, you know, top of society. So say they started making fun of the way Sayyidina Bilal Radhiallahu was calling the Adhan. And one of them was particularly, you know, loud about this. And he was making a lot of fun of Bilal and he said, see how he calls the Adhan and what is this man and this and this. Now this was, the matter was brought to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's attention. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called them. Now remember, this is not pre Fatah Makkah. This is after Fatah Makkah. Rasulullah is in the middle of his army. He is the commander. He is going to Taif. Right? So these guys, the moment they said, Rasulullah wants you, they said, oh, we are in trouble now. This is serious. So they came and Rasulullah said, uh, I hear you are making fun of uh, Bilal. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't mean this. He said, no, no, I'm just asking you. He says, who was making the loudest fun? So they said, it was this person. So Rasulullah said, well, come close. Now that man thought, this is the end, because he's calling me close, now he will make a sign to somebody and <laughs> there goes my head. But anyway, what does he do? He, he is helpless because he's in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of the army. So they all came close and he came right close to him. <clears throat> and then Rasulullah tells him, 
He says, do you want to learn how to call the other? The man is shocked. He says, oh, what did he say? Rasulullah said, do you want to learn how to call the other? So he said, uh, yes, Ya Rasulullah. So Rasulullah said, all right, then repeat after me. And Rasulullah said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The man repeated. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. The man repeated. Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. He repeated. Hayya ala salah. He repeated. Hayya ala al-falah. He repeated. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illa Allah. The man repeated. Rasulullah SAW said, you learnt, and of course I only repeat. This is not the exact Adhan of Rasulullah he said everything twice and so on. But so he said, you learned? He said, yes, I learned. He said, repeat. He repeated, he called the Adhan. Then the man said to him, see the effect of Akhlaq. Who is this man? He is one of the big shots of Quraysh, young man. And he is the man who was making fun of Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu after learning the Adhan from Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the man says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I have a request. He said, what's the request? He said, Ya Rasulullah, Bilal is your muaddin in Medina. Make me your muaddin in Makkah. He said, give me the responsibility. Make me your muaddin in the Haram. Hajiba. Rasulullah said, you are the Muazir in Makkah. And the writers of the Sira said, the man died at the age of 99 or something like this. And he said, every Salah, he used to come to the Masjid early, he used to make Wudu, he used to make Tawaf, and then after finishing Tawaf, he would make Turaka Salah, and then he would go and he would call the Adhan. He did that for every Salah, every day, for the rest of his life. This is applied Islam. This is applied Islam. Rasulullah could have ordered the man to be executed. Who would have, who would have criticized that? He could have ordered the man to be beaten up. He, nobody could have criticized him. He was the... He could have done that. He was the Nabi of Allah. He was the commander-in-chief of the army. Who was there to question him? What did he do? The way he responded to a man who was hostile to Islam was such that it completely turned the heart of the man towards Islam. Total. Purpose we have been created is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we do that? By practicing Islam 100%. The morning begins with that. We go to work, it begins with that in the workplace. How do we work? We work with the consciousness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. So we do the best possible job that we have been asked to do. We take time off for salah, but we do not come to the masjid from the workplace and in Salatul Zuhar, we do not recite Suratul Baqarah in the first ayah and Suratul Al Imran in the second ayah. Eh? Some people take 45 minutes for Zuhar and 45 minutes for Asr. And they take three minutes for Fajr, and they take two minutes for Maghrib, and they take three minutes for Isha, because that they are praying on their own. Yeah? But Zohar and Asar is during the work time, so SubhanAllah, you ask them, what are you doing? I'm in Salah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, in Salah. We don't do that. We work with honesty and sincerity. Why? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for the boss. Not for the boss. To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to present a picture of Islam to the world and say, who is a Muslim? Here is a Muslim. The 
best employee, the best quality, the best integrity, Muslim. Employment announcements say only Muslims need to apply. Eh? Can you imagine that situation? Today if I tell you this, you might think it's a joke. You might think it is a joke that a, that a multinational company says only Muslims need to apply. Why? Because only they are fit for us because we want certain standards and only Muslims can give it. We come back home. Wife, children, house problem. What do we do? Again, live with the awareness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. I am good with my wife. Why? Because it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am good with my children. Why? Because it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I work in the house, I serve my family, why? Because it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do not sit in front of the TV with my feet up and say, get me some food. And then when the food comes, the food is not tasty, take it and throw it. Who told, who taught you to cook? Your mother did not teach you anything. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi wa Food is not tasty, we say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, this comes from, who is the Razaq, Udul Quwatil Mateen, who, your wife? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillah, Inna Allah huwa Razaq, Udul Quwatil Mateen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we feed you with our power, Alhamdulillah, food is tasty, Alhamdulillah, food is not tasty, Alhamdulillah, Ala kulli hal, Then time for sleep, we make wudu, we do the azkar before sleep, we read the surah al-mulk and surah al-sajda because we know from the sunnah of Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to do this. And then we sleep, we sleep in the way that Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to sleep. Of course later on you can turn around and so on and so forth but at least to begin with you sleep on your right side and so on too. So from the moment you wake up to the moment we sleep and of course because we do sleep in that way the entire life has become ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we come to the collective purpose. What is the collective purpose? Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat minan nas or lin nas? Sure, not minan nas. Ukhrijat linnas For the people Why was the Muslim created? For an-nas Not ukhrijat lil muslimin Not ukhrijat Lil anybody In particular Ukhrijat linnas For all of humanity For the Muslims for the non-Muslims, for everybody. Ukhrijat linnas. What is the meaning of Ukhrijat linnas? Ta'amuruna bil maruf. What is the meaning of Ta'amuruna bil maruf? If you see somebody doing bad, hammer him. No? <laughs> Ta'amuruna bil maruf is just make fatwa haram halal, haram halal, haram halal. Is that Ta'amuruna bil maruf? No. Al-Amur bil maruf is to enjoy everything which is beneficial. Everything which is good to do, all actions which are good. Naturally, all that is halal is tayyib, which is good, so we do that. Watanahun aril munkar, we stop everything which is munkar, which is disobedience, and obviously all disobedience is bad. But how do we do that? And I gave you an example of how Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it. Now, one important point in this, Kuntum khaira ummatin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you are the best of the people, ukhrijat linnas, plural. You have been selected in plurality together. Now what is this ummah? So Allah, I'm always very happy to come and pray in this masjid because apart from the Haramain Sharifain, this is one of the few places in the world where you hear different styles of recitation of the Quran, you see different styles of people worshipping, Alhamdulillah. There is no problem with somebody worshipping in a particular way. You fold your hands here, you fold your hands down below, you hold your hand on the side, or you move your finger, you don't move your finger, there's nobody who catches your finger and breaks it because you're moving it. 
or you say you are mushrik because you know you move your finger so many asadu la ilaha illallah once and so many times in that like you have like 25 gods eh? i mean every time is one god which which one is this eh? inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun we have all of this we have in our muslim umma my brothers and sisters we need to cry about this in our muslim umma we have masajid where there is a notice this masjid is for this group and so and so group is not permitted inside the masjid subhanallah and at the same time allah subhanahu wa taala what did allah say about a masjid allah said masjid is the house of allah did he say it is your house or my house no in your house you don't want to call people no problem that's your that's your choice but in the house of allah who are you to say that somebody is permitted and somebody is not permitted who are you to say that because the, the masjid is waqaf ila allah it is not anybody's control once you build a masjid there are various conditions of a place being designated a masjid in different madhahib some some have some conditions some have some conditions but one condition which is common to all the madhabs is that a masjid is waqaf ila allah till the day of judgment once a masjid has been built and it is work up it cannot be converted to something else you cannot make this into a shopping mall or something if you like no masjid is a, you, even if you break it you can rebuild it but it what you build again is only a masjid you cannot put something else here. i cannot make this into my house no so you make the masjid work up ila allah and then we put a condition and we say only so and so can come and so and so is not permitted ajiba this is the state you know in in the one day i tell you a sad story i was in in india in one place and i was looking for a masjid to pray because there was no masjid i couldn't see any masjid i stopped my car and there was a hindu guy there he was a auto rickshaw driver and i asked him i said is there a masjid around here he's asking me which masjid do you want hindu guy i said what do you mean, which masjid he said no no because there are different masjid there is a there is a masjid of tablighi -e jamaat and there is a salafi masjid and he is telling me all of this that <laughs> because he is a taxi driver no people take him to places so he said you want a salafi masjid or you want the hanafi masjid or he said there is a sufi masjid you want a sufi masjid which one you want hindu guy is telling me this i say inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun what are we doing to this deen of ours inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun subhanallah ajeeb A man wants to come and worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we put a condition: you can worship here only if you make rafai then, and if you do not make rafai then, you cannot worship. Or otherwise, if you make rafai then, khalas, then you are sorry. We don't pray behind you because you raise your hand. Alhamdulillah, in this masjid I do not see that. I am very happy that when I come here, Subhanallah. As long as you are worshiping Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you, you know, do, <laughs> do whatever you want, yeah. umma the when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is uh, very difficult to say this was his greatest thing because every part of his life is the greatest thing but if i can tell you one thing which is the greatest need today it is this formation of the umma and remember islam started and islam grew only from madina not from makkah and it grew from madina because of the formation of the ummah and the whole formation of the ummah was what it was to bring together hearts joining of the hearts it was to bring together people who were completely different today we don't understand many of us who come from africa and people like me who come from india and so on we still understand something about tribal loyalties and tribes and so on most people from western countries they don't understand that anymore but believe me If you live in a in a society where tribes are strong and tribal loyalties are strong, you will know what I mean. It's a very very strong power to break that and to say that the only loyalty and the only brotherhood is the brotherhood of faith. Inna umma tu kum umma tan wahidan wa ana rabbu kum faabudun. Kala tabar ko taal. You are one umma. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, whether you are black or green or you have red stripes on a yellow nose or who cares. Eh? One number. We say, "Shahdu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah." 
the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They asked him, "Ya Rasulullah, who is a Muslim?" He said, "The one who says, 'Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah,' and the one who worships in our direction to the Kaaba, and the one who eats our slaughter is a Muslim." Khalas. Whether Allah will accept his salah or not is between him and Allah. Believe me, my brother, Allah is not going to ask my opinion whether he should accept your salah. And Allah is not going to ask your opinion whether you should accept my salah. So don't worry about that. Do not worry about that. That's not your problem. It's not my problem. Our problem is to make sure our own salah is accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Today we are not worried about our own salah. We are worried about somebody else's salah. Eh? I'll tell you a famous story of Imam Ghazali, Rahmatullah. I am looking at the time and just signal to me when I should stop talking. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala his elder brother it says that his elder brother did not used to pray behind him so he was very upset so he went to his mother and he said to his mother my elder brother does not pray behind me please tell him so his mother called him and said what's the problem he is a good man you know he is Ghazali so why don't you pray behind him so the elder brother says when he is in salah he has no khushu he is thinking about something else ajeeb and how he knew what was in his mind allah only knows but but anyway So the mother said, "No, no, don't do. This. You just go pray behind." Him. So the next salah, Imam Ghazali is leading the salah. Elder brother is behind him. In the second rakat, he broke his salah and he walked away. So now is the bigger problem. You know, first of all, the man does not pray. Now he breaks salah and goes out in the middle. That's the bigger issue. So Imam Ghazali went back to the mother. He said, "You know, this is what he's doing." So the mother called him. She said, "What? Why did you do that?" So the elder brother said, "You ask him. You ask him why I did that." So Imam Ghazali said to his mother, "Yes, it's true. You know, in the second rakat, I was thinking about a particular masala of fiqh which I was thinking about. So that was thought in my mind." So the elder brother says, "See, I told you, he has no khushu." You know what the mother says? See the beauty of people who are true on their deen. You know what the mother says? The mother does not say, "Masha Allah, I've got awli Allah in my khanda." You know, the elder one knows what is in the heart of the other one. Eh? She didn't say that. You know what she said? She said, "Inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun." She said, "I have two sons." and neither of them has khushu in the sala one is thinking about a problem and the other one is thinking about his brother he said la haula wala quwwata illa billah get out of here <laughs> he said think about your sala why are you bothered about somebody else's sala what is your problem you are praying to allah or somebody else oh. <laughs> this is our problem today kuntum khaira ummatin first of all we have to create the umma then we can do amar bil maruf wa nahyan anil munkar My brothers and sisters, I am finishing my talk because we have come to the end of my time. By advising myself and reminding myself and advising you, let us bring hearts together. Let us look at commonalities. The differences, leave them to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That is between Allah and the slave of Allah. If there is something which is clearly wrong, then go and in private, with love and with affection and with concern and compassion, advise your brother. Advise him once. Don't become a pain in his neck. Advise him once. Still love him. Still be good to him. Then he will listen to your advice, inshallah. And if he does not listen to your advice, don't worry about that. Make du'a to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Stand before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because the changing of the hearts is in whose hands? The hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Bring the ummah together. I advise you and advise myself to work for this. and i ask allah subhanahu wa taala to bless you and to strengthen you and to put the love of himself and his nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in your hearts and to use you as the glue as the adhesive to create an ummah subhanallah in this masjid when i look i see so many different faces each one is an ayat of allah subhanahu wa taala each one is a sign of the creator mashallah this is what we need to create in the whole world people from different nationalities different backgrounds different racial uh, origins and so forth all sitting together for one reason only and that is and that reason is for the love of allah subhanahu wa taala for the for the ibadah of allah subhanahu wa taala and that is what we need to create outside in the world and i advise you my brothers and i ask my i ask allah subhanahu wa taala to help me also to do that is to create this umma because subhanallah it's when the umma was created that this deen became al izharul islam ala kulli adyan happened when the umma was created and after the umma was created not before the umma was created and we have to recreate this umma if we want al izharul al izharul islam ala kulli adyan and we ask allah subhanahu wa taala to help us 
and to bless us and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to help everybody who is in any need of help and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us and to make it easy for us to please Him. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.